Welcome to the sixth video on first odor responses. This particular video is focused on the use of MATLAB. Now first of all, we'll note that a number of GUIs have been produced so that you don't have to be an expert MATLAB user at first, just to be able to play around and get the idea of how first order responses uh, change as you change model parameters. The particular three we're going to look at here are first order responses, tank level animation 2 and first order dynamics. So here's a screen capture of first order responses. And what I'll do first before I go and illustrate its use is demonstrate what uh, information is given on this GUI. So first of all you'll see up here you have a box which gives you the system model. This is written as a transfer function and you will cover transfer functions in lectures if you've not done it quite yet. And then beneath that you'll see there's a slider which allows you to enter the time constant and you'll see here that 3 has gone here in the transfer function so that's the time constant. You also have a slider to enter the gain you'll see that's 2 and you'll see where that 2 has gone is there. So there's a direct correspondence between the time constant, the gain and the transfer function and you simply enter the time constant and the gain that you want and what the slider does is give you the step response. So you can see the step response here given by I'll overlay it, see this blue curve and what it's also done for you is it's marked very clearly where's the first time constant, you'll see that's at 3, where's two time constants at 6 Where's three time constants at nine. So you can see the evolution of the response with respect to time constants. What it's also done in terms of your curve sketching is it's shown you this initial gradient. There you go. The initial gradient reaches the steady state in one time constant. And finally, it's shown you the 63% line, the 86% line, and the 95 line. So what I'm going to do now is move to the um, to the actual GUI so you can see it working in practice. So there we go. I type into MATLAB first order responses in the relevant folder so make sure you know which folder it's stored in. Press return and there you go. The GUI has come up. Now because I'm on a small screen to make this video I'm going to have to make the GUI just a little bit smaller so it will fit so you can see there you go and now watch what I'm going to do I'm going to change the time constant by clicking in this relevant slider see it's gone to 2.75 and you'll notice that the curve changed all the time constants moved um, and the, st no, the steady state didn't change obviously but all the time constants moved if I make it smaller again there down to 2 you can see all the time constants have moved and the curve has changed I can also edit the gain and you notice as I reduce the gain the steady state comes down and down and down now you can actually if you want put something direct into these edit boxes so I don't want a time constant of 2 I want something like 1.93 so I can put that in and there you go and similarly I can enter the gain direct if I happen to know what it is, let's say it's 1.56 and there you go, there's your curve. Right, I'll close that and we'll go back to our um, presentation. Right, tank level animation. So the purpose of this GUI is to give you an idea of how the level in the tank will change. You'll notice that this particular tank has got an inflow given up here and it's got an outflow from the bottom which replicates the sorts of problems we will do in lectures and <coughs> you'll also notice there's a little option up here which says open loop which basically means <coughs> that I'm just going to fix the level of input um, in this case either at 0 1 and see what the level does you get a picture of the step response in this graph here so that shows you how the depth changes with time. You'll see the initial depth marked here was 0.2. Um, the input was 1. You'll see the inputs here. It's got a step. It's gone from 0 to 1. So it's a step. And essentially that's how the depth, depth changes uh, with a unit step 
starting from 0 0.2. So again, let's go to this particular uh, animation and see what else you can do with it. So there we go. Um, I go into my MATLAB window and I will pull up the relevant command. There it is tank level animation 2. Um, oh, sorry, I'm in the wrong folder. Uh, easy mistake to make. So I move to the folder where this is stored and then run it. Here we go. So this just about fits. Yeah, this fits without having to reduce it. So you'll see it's just like the one we've just seen. Here I've got an initial depth of 0.5. And if I go at the top here, you'll see it's set open loop input equals zero. So if I now run the simulation, I do that over here with a press to run simulation. Let's see what happens. So the initial depth was 0.5. There's no input flow. So clearly you expect this tank to gradually drain. And hopefully you'll agree that's what you've seen. You'll see that the depth starts at 0.5 and goes to zero. The flow rate into the tank is marked at zero and you'll see the tank has gradually em emptied. If I want, I can change the initial depth. Let's say it was 0.9 and run again. And you'll see now it starts from 0.9, but again follows the exponential curve you expect as it empties. Now, what if you want a step response? Well, I go up to this option here and say I want the open loop uh, with u equals 1. There it is. And let's set the initial depth to be 0 0.4. It's arbitrary. And press to run. As you see there, the depth has started at 0 0.4. And you can see it follows the exponential curve from 0 0.4 to the steady state. Now, in this particular case, the steady state gain is 1. You can see that from the model um, in the green box, g of s equals 0 0.2 over s plus 0 0.2. So with an input of 1, the steady state is 1. Now, we're not going to talk about the uh, closed loop facets of this uh, particular GUI because that's a different topic. And finally, there's a GUI called First Order Dynamics, which is um, designed to help bridge the gap with some other real problems. In fact, there's a laboratory in the department which exactly replicates this. So what I'm going to do is show you how that works, but not describe the real laboratory because you probably won't be able to access it. The key thing to notice is it's based on a DC server with a simple load. And what you'll find is the speed voltage relationship in a DC servo follows a simple first order model. But of course, in practice, there's going to be a little bit of uncertainty. So let's go and find this model. So again, um, we go in here. I don't want, um, I want to get rid of that, don't I, that particular thing because it's, uh, oh well, let's not worry, it's not letting me. So let's uh, find first order dynamics. There it is, and run it. And here you go. Now again, the window just about fits. Uh, I might need to make it slightly smaller to fit in this screen. There you go, you can just about see it. So what you can see is you'll see there's a slider where you can enter the voltages you want to use. So we'll use that first. So I'm gonna start with a voltage of zero and then press this box that says simulate system with new voltage. Now, what can you see? You can see down at the bottom a really messy, noisy curve. If you look at this circle, this shows you the movement of the DC servo and you can see it's actually not spinning at all. So I've put a zero voltage in and it's not moving. Um, that's probably what you would expect. But the system response, you actually get noise and that's largely coming from the sensor. So that's what you're seeing at the bottom. So now let's uh, add that into our graph. So see this box here, put velocity reading into graph. So I click that and there it appears, naught and naught. Next I try one volt, simulate system, and you'll notice that even though I've put in a volt, one volt, the DC servo is not moving and that's because of stiction. Let's put in two volts, simulate the system with that. Again, the system's not moving, so even with two volts, nothing's happening. But I'm going to put this velocity reading into my graph. There is another pink box, so we can see what the pink square, sorry, so we can see what's happening. 
Now let's try 3 volts and simulate the system. And now it's beginning to move. We've got rid of the stiction. You can see the DC servo is spinning. We can see what speed it's got. So I want to add this to my graph by clicking this red box. There we go. And now you will see the graph will try and estimate the gain of your system. Let's try 4 volts and simulate. So now you'll see it's spinning a bit faster because you've got a higher voltage. Add that to the graph. And now you're beginning to see a trend. OK. You're beginning to see as you increase the voltage, it goes faster. All right. And you can begin to see that the relationship between the velocity that it spins and the voltage is pretty much following a straight line, but with the exception that if you have small voltages, so there I've done minus 1, nothing happens. Minus 2 just about moves a bit. OK. And then minus 3 you'll see it moves a lot better. OK, so you'll see there is pretty much a straight line graph, OK, as long as the voltage is big enough. But if you use small voltages, it doesn't move at all. And that represents a real characteristic. Now, if you look at the bottom, you can see the uh, system response. So the next question is, say, right, from that response, using your curve sketching observations, can you estimate the gain and the time constant of this system. Now, actually, the gain's given for you because it's the gradient of the curve up here. So I can go there where it says gain, and I'm going to put uh, 0.65. Now, what about the time constant? Well, you'll notice this real curve is a bit noisy. You can't pick the 63% point just like that. You're going to have to estimate it a bit. But what I'm going to do, just for, for speed here, I'm going to say it's about 8. Um, and now you see this pink box says, simulate the system with this estimate. So there you go. Does that response represent roughly what you expect? In other words, does this green line, is it similar to this blue line? Um, I will let you ponder that. But anyway, you've seen the GUI, and we'll go back to our presentation. How about using MATLAB Direct? What we're going to do here is we're going to show you two different methods for using MATLAB for first order systems. First, we're going to use dsolve, which will appeal to mathematicians because it's solving the ODE directly. And then we will convert the ODE into Laplace and use some Laplace methods, which are impulse.m and step.m. So here we go. You need to determine the response for 60xdt plus 4x equals 3 with initial condition x of 0 equals 2. Well, this code here shows you how to enter that into MATLAB. So here's the line, this line here. And what you want to do is see the link between this line and what you had up here. So the x of 0 equals 2 has gone in there. And you'll see in here, I've written the ODE pretty much as it comes. 6 times dx means 60x dt, plus 4 times x means 4x equals 3. And I've just added the initial condition. And you'll notice what MATLAB's come back with is a solution in analytic form. So x of t is 5 divided by 4 e to the 2t over 3. Now, if that's a bit confusing for you, it's, it's written it as 5 over 4 e to the 2t over 3, which is actually going to be equal to 1.25 e to the minus 2t over 3. So you have to get used to the fact that MATLAB's a bit quirky and sometimes it puts these exponentials in the denominator and you can put them back in the numerator by changing the sign of the exponent. Now, if you want to plot this, then you need to find numeric values. This has given you an analytic solution as a function of time. In order to get numeric values, you need to use this function subs, which stands for substitute, I substitute some values of time into this expression and work out what I get. So I've used the terminology x values, as in give me the numbers, equals subs, so substitute into my function x of t, and now I'm given the values that I want it to use, so from 0 to 5 in steps of 0 0.1. And then I've said plot what I get. So I've put the time instant in, in the x-axis, 0 to 5 in steps of 0.1, and x-values. And you'll see you get the curve here. 
So now I can see the curve I expected. So it started from 2, which was the initial condition you were given, and it finished at 0 0.8, and that probably, uh, sorry, not 0 0.8, it's actually going down to 0 0.75, which is what you would expect from 3 over 4 in the model. Right, here's a second example. Determine the response for 0 0.1 dx dt plus 2x equals 5, x of 0 equals minus 1. So there's the code, and again you will see there's a direct link between that line there and the parameters that you were provided. The other lines down here, you'll see replicate what we had on the previous slide. So we've solved for z as a function of time, then we've worked out the values of z numerically at some specified time instance. Here I've gone 0 to 0 0.2 in steps of 0 0.002, and then I've done a plot. So there's your plot. You'll notice you've got to be careful in specifying the time instant to be appropriate to the system you've got. And for this particular system, the time constant is 0.05, which is why I've put an end time of only uh, 0.2 seconds, so we get something reasonable. Now what we should do next is we should show you real time doing this. Okay. What happens if you want to use Laplace? Well, this slide shows you how you can plot the first order responses using Laplace with MATLAB. So again, you'll notice I've got my differential equation at the top. There is 6 dx dt plus 4x equals 3, x of 0 equals 2. If I turn that into Laplace, which I'm not going to go through slowly here because that's the content of a separate lecture, then you get this answer here, that x of s equals 3 plus 12s over 6x squared plus 4s. So now what I need to do is enter that into MATLAB. Now the key thing to look at is what are the parameters of the numerator, there they are, 3 plus 12s, and the parameters of the denominator, 6, 4, and 0. And you'll notice I've simply put those parameters into that command there. So x of s equals tf, that means create a transfer function. The first expression, square brackets 12, 3, says these are the coefficients of the numerator, starting with maximum powers of s, so the 12 first, and then the 3, and then comma, and then you put the coefficients of the denominator, which here are 6, 4, and 0, 0, because there's no constant. And you'll notice it's given for us the corresponding transfer function. So we can check, yes, it's done what I expect. It's given me 12s plus 3 over 6s squared plus 4s. And then the command I need to solve for this or to plot it is impulse. So impulse x basically means do the inverse Laplace of whatever Laplace transform is in x. And there you go. There's the plot you get. And you can see it goes from 2, which is what you expected, down to 0.75 which is what you expected. Here's a different example. Okay, 5 dx dt plus x equals 2, x of 0 equals 2. And again, I've put this into a Laplace transform, and there it is. But what I've done here is I've been careful to separate out this step term. The, um, the 2 on the right-hand side is essentially equivalent to a step of magnitude 2. And so I've put the 2 in with uh, the other part of the transform, but separated out the s. So we're now I've got a transform 2 over 5s plus 1 times 1 over s. And I can solve for this by creating the, the uh, left-hand part of the transform. So there it is, g equals tf 2 comma 5 1, and you'll see that gives me 2 over 5s plus 1. So I've just created a transfer function representation for the left arm bit of x of s. And then I've noticed that this x of s, or this transfer, is multiplied by 1 over s, which is in essence a step. So I can now use the MATLAB function step. So step of g, 20 will basically multiply 2 over 5s plus 1 by 1 over s, and then do the inverse Laplace. It assumes a zero initial condition, which you'll notice I put up here. So to use step, use a zero initial condition. And there you see I've started from zero and I've gone up to my steady state of two, which is what I would have expected. So before we finish, I will just quickly demonstrate the um, 
transfer function parts with you here. So let's do a different one. H equals TF of let's say one comma four five. Now what will that represent? That will represent a transfer function you can see here one over four S plus five. So if I go impulse of H then it will give me the uh, basically the response of the corresponding first order system with um, no input. Okay, so there you go. And you can see it started from a given initial condition which you could trace back from that transform and it's finished at zero. Alternatively, I could have done something like step H and that would have given me the step response. So there you are, starts from naught, finishes at 0.2. But what you'll notice is that you need to write down your model carefully and work out which Laplaces you need to represent exactly what you want. But what, what we want you to see in, in simple terms is impulse and step are very easy to use. So that is the end.